As you heard, my name is Guy Lundy, and it's always nice to be introduced uh, with the correct pronunciation of my name because, of course, the vast majority of people in South Africa pronounce it Lundy. And so many people expect a black guy to walk up here when, uh, when I arrive, which, of course, uh, is a bit of a shock to some, because I'm, I'm not, by the way. Um, people, as I say, get it, get it wrong, and the, the most uh, hilarious, or for some, pronunciation of my name that I've heard is Gay Looney. <laughs> Please don't call me that, uh, it doesn't go down so well. My, my role is as a futurist, so my background is in economics and I've, I've moved essentially into the, the looking to what the future holds because one of the many reasons being that economists very often can't agree with themselves. You know, you've got uh, one version and the other version and if that one doesn't go right then it's possibly this one. The nice thing about the future is that it hasn't happened yet. But what we can do as futurists is we can look at what happens around us, we can look at the environment that we're operating in, and we can try to understand a little bit more about how that might play itself out. This quote comes from one of the professors at Salamos University, the Institute for Futures Research, Professor Philip Spies. And he said, we don't describe the future we see, we see the future we describe. Okay, so looking at, at where we're we going in the future, it often helps to look at where we've come from in the past. Uh, and this is a, a kind of graphic depiction of what are known as Kondratiev's waves, or long waves. Now, Kondratiev was a Soviet economist uh, under the Stalinist regime, who was tasked uh, in the end of the 1920s, early 1930s, to look at and find proof of the fact that capitalism had collapsed when you had the Great Crash in 1929. Of course, Stalin was wanting to show that the only way forward was Soviet-style uh, communism because capitalism was dead. So he went back all the way to the Industrial Revolution, and at that stage he found that capitalism, in fact, wasn't dead, which was not so good for Kondratiev because shortly thereafter he was dead, which is uh, what happens when you give Stalin the wrong answer. Uh, and he found that there were three major cycles that, that capitalism had gone through in the world. And each of those cycles was, con um, was, was uh, characterized by similar processes, which lasted sort of 40 to 60 year periods. And it was a period of growth that was led largely by a key technology. You can see that the steam power technology led the Industrial Revolution, followed by the implementation of railways, followed by electricity and cars in the early 1900s, uh, and subsequent to Kondratiev's death, followed by computers. <laughs> That big growth kind of hits a bit of a, a bump in the road and would often cause a, a bit of a, a, a drop, which was then followed by a resurgence. And if you looked at it in the 1920s, you could see the resurgence that took place after the First World War and was followed by the Roaring Twenties, which of course came to a rather sudden stop in 1929 with the Great Depression, which essentially led to the Second World War, uh, the conditions that enabled the Second World War to happen. So that leads to a big crash. And what we've seen very recently is exactly that. So if you believe in these long waves, and a lot of economists don't, they believe that this is essentially looking back and applying patterns to something that doesn't actually have a pattern. But you can see that over the last 40 to 60 years, the computer era has taken us through a significant period of growth in the 50s and 60s, followed by the 1973 oil crisis in the 70s, which was a, a rough time followed by the resurgence through the 90s and the 2000s, and this real heavy period of growth that we experienced during the mid-2000s, 2004 to 2008, followed by the big crash that happened in October 2008. So where we sit right now is essentially at the bottom of that fourth wave, which if you follow the logic, says that we are at the beginning of a next wave. And there are many that believe that that next wave is likely to be driven by the technologies, the, the joint technologies of nanotechnology, the very small, and biotechnology, the, the technology around genetics and around very, very uh, small things that take place in, in the, the human and other organisms. So those combinations may well lead to all sorts of new inventions and new forms of growth over the next 20 to 30 years. So I would agree that the, the, the world economy is starting to come out of that, uh, that period of, of uh, recession that we've had at the moment. But I think if we look further into the next 15, 20 years, I think that we can expect a continuation of that growth 
off the back of new technologies, new inventions. And many of those technologies and inventions around the science of the very small and biotechnology will have direct impacts on your industry. So looking at, at some of the, the shorter tr term trends and some of the things that are happening in this world, I think that the first thing we have to recognize is that the world is, is irreversibly globalized. We're not going to go back to what happened at the end of 1929 and the Great Depression where world markets essentially shut down and international trade just stopped happening. And it led to the, the, the spreading of the global uh, Great Depression around the world. So the world is globalized. What happens in one side of the world is going to affect virtually every other side of the world. And of course, the initial point about that is the financial instability that is happening. Greece, Ireland, Spain, Italy, uh, the United States, various others are feeling the pain and we're feeling the pain with them. And we're not alone. There are people around the world that are feeling that same pain. I think that one of the things from a South African perspective that has helped us and that has enabled us to kind of ride through that pain to some degree has been the safety of our financial system, particularly our banks. So if you look at the World Economic Forum, they have ranked South African banks as being the sixth safest in the world. So I would agree that with the, the idea that, that one needs to be looking east and one needs to be looking at the, the partners in BRICS to see where future growth is going to come from. Uh, we, um, the professor talked about uh, New Zealand and, and some of the schools teaching Mandarin. My, daughter, my son and daughter's school in Cape Town has this year started teaching Mandarin. So we need to start thinking about how do we interact with the Chinese. The, the dark blue colors sit essentially in the emerging markets, and those are the areas where we can expect above 5% economic growth. You can see the red and pink areas of Europe and low growth areas around the United States. Uh, this is coming out of the IMF, by the way, the International Monetary Fund. And so you can see that economic activity is much more focused, and economic growth is much more focused on Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And the interesting thing about us, even though we're not sitting above 5% growth, is that we're pretty much equidistant between those three regions. We sit in quite an interesting physical location between the three regions of the world that are growing at the highest rates. What's also happening is an interesting demographic shift. And, um, and this is shown by two things. One is the, the continuing growth of the world population. Just uh, last week, there was a big hoo-ha made about the fact that it's estimated that we've just reached 7 billion people in the world. And another thing that's happening in, in addition to that growth of population is a growth in the urban population. So what's happening around the world, and this is a projection from the United States, uh, the United Nations, sorry, going towards 2050, is that while the, the global population is expected to reach 9.2 billion in 2050, after which it's expected to plateau and potentially start dropping uh, in the second half of the century. At the same time as that growth, you're seeing that dark blue line start to drop lower and lower. More and more people are moving to cities. And the United Nations thinks that by 2050, 70% of the world's population will live in cities and towns, not in deep rural areas. Now that has, uh, that has opportunities and it has challenges. One of the challenges is that people in cities don't grow food. I'm not sure if you noticed that the last time you went to town. But they live in high rises and they don't have uh, land, they don't have the, the ability to, to grow food. So more and more percentage of the world's population is going to be reliant on the people sitting in this room for their source of food. Uh, and of course also the source of labor is, is something that you're going to start seeing moving more and more to the cities. And we see this in South Africa. South Africa is already 60% urbanized, but that growth of urbanization or that move into the cities is continuing apace. You just have to look at a place like Dipsluit or Kailicha, somewhere like that, and you can see the number of people that are willing to leave their homes in the rural areas and go and stay in shacks in the cities because they see opportunity for themselves. So that provides an opportunity for you to become the suppliers to this growing number of people that are not able to supply themselves. Moving into some of the impacts of, of what's likely to happen, certainly in the next five to 10 years, um, largely because of this economic downturn. I think there are two major changes that we can expect to see over the next five years socially. 
and societally. One of them being an increase in conservatism. If you look at what happened in the 1920s, where you know it was all about drugs and alcohol and the jitterbug dance and all that sort of thing, and then you move into the 1930s, and you see the change in conservative lifestyle from the dress to the family values, to the religious, uh, the approach to religion, to societal attitudes. Again, if you look at the difference between the 1960s and the 1970s after the oil crisis, what happens after an economic crisis is that people become a lot more conservative. Now, I think in South Africa's case and in the world's case, that's probably no bad thing right now. Uh, we have uh, issues around the family, we have people moving away from the church, we have various things that have, have caused all sorts of societal problems. And I think that the, the growing level of conservatism, longer dresses, less bling, uh, more, more focus on the family, fewer fathers just abandoning families and leaving, is likely to be a positive thing for society and, and, and social life in South Africa. The other thing that's likely to happen, and it's possibly related to this conservatism, is an increase in regulation. Now, this is happening all over the world, and it's been happening for the last 10 years already. Ever since uh, 2001, September 11th, and then the Enron crisis, Worldcom crisis, etc., you've seen laws like Sarbanes-Oxley in the United States, which have made it incredibly difficult for global companies to operate without being completely wrapped up in red tape. We're seeing the same thing uh, in South Africa and all over the world as governments try to regulate an increasingly complex situation. Bigger populations, more complex environments, more people living in cities. The only thing that they know what to do is to create regulation. So we can expect regulation to continue uh, over the next while. And possibly in your environment, you need to be thinking around how do you get involved in helping to create that legislation and those, and those regulations, rather than sitting back and, uh, and hoping that it doesn't affect you too deeply. Moving on to Africa and, and what's happening across the continent, um, north of us, and of course we must forget that we are part of the African continent. It's sometimes easy to forget that because the, the, the paths of our development have been so fundamentally different. But it's very important for us to understand what's happening in the, in the African economy across the continent because I do believe that much of our own growth is going to be coming from those countries north of us. It's estimated that about two-thirds of the world's unutilized arable land is on the African continent. So, you know, in option two around moving from South Africa to some of our neighbors, I can tell you there's a tremendous amount of land that's currently completely unutilized. Uh, and countries that are very interested in having the kind of skill that we have in this room uh, to come in and utilize those resources and grow crops more effectively than they've been done uh, in the past. Also, things like hydroelectricity. There is a dam that has been mooted uh, on the Congo River for a number of years, which would involve about three or four countries that would be able to produ produce enough renewable energy for the whole of Africa. Unfortunately, political issues have not enabled it to happen, but if we can get that off the ground, we can provide renewable energy in the form of hydroelectricity to virtually the whole continent of Africa. So huge untapped resources. And of course, there's the stuff that sits under the ground as well, which is what the Chinese and the Indians are so interested in at the moment. What also helps, of course, is that the average African is a young, urban, and educated person on an increasing basis. So there's more education happening. In many cases, the, the average person outside of South Africa has a better uh, average education than the average South African. Um, more and more people are moving to cities, so it's an increasingly urban continent, and it's a young continent. So this means people in the working age, people in the consuming age, uh, and that, of course, will help to drive uh, the economies of Africa. Another interesting thing that's happening with young People like the military regime in Nigeria, you saw large numbers of people leaving and moving over to, to places like New York, London, Paris, etc. They've spent 10, 15 years working there and getting international experience. I spoke at the New York Stock Exchange two years ago and met a group of Nigerians who had been there for 10, 15 years each. And they were all intending to come back to Nigeria, bringing with them the experience that they had of banking and of working on the stock exchange in New York back to Nigeria because things had changed so much. So those, all of those things help to drive 
and create opportunities, which if you look at this map, this picture of Africa at night, you can look at it in one of two ways. You can say it's a very dark continent, very few chances, very few opportunities because there's just nothing going on there. The lights aren't on, nobody's home. Or you can look at the lights as competition and the dark patches as opportunity. And the lights up north, as you can see in Europe, are on a hell of a lot more and there's a lot more competition. So Africa is certainly, in my view, a continent of opportunity. Of course, for South Africans to move into that environment, we need to feel relatively comfortable uh, that we can, if, if we're wanting to stay here and, and, and start investing in other countries around the continent, we need to feel that our own environment is safe, particularly our own economy. So let's have a look at whether the party has ended or whether some of the economic fundamentals here uh, are working. And I don't want to repeat too much of what we've already heard in the previous presentation. But just briefly, I think first of all we have relatively low inflation. So our inflation is sitting at 45%. But remember in the 1980s where it was sitting at 16, 17%. So we're sitting at relatively low inflation by, by our historical standards and of course by international standards. If you look at the other emerging markets, they're sitting generally on 9, 10, 12% inflation. It also helps us to have quite low interest rates. And I say quite low because it's not as low as, let's say, Japan, where it's about zero. Um, it's also never low enough. I recently built a house, um, so I know that it's never low enough. Zero percent would probably be very nice. But if you look at this, uh, this graph of where we've come over the last 20 years, you can see that we're sitting um, on a 30-year low in terms of our interest rates. Now, much of that, of course, is driven by where the world economy is. Uh, and my own view is that for the next while, we're probably likely to sit uh, with the same rates. It's unlikely we're going to go down too much or that we're going to go up in any kind of a hurry. But you will remember, and I can imagine in the farming environment, what it must have been like on 25.5% interest rates uh, back in 1998-99. Very, very difficult to manage. So sitting on the lower interest rates that we've got at the moment certainly helps us to plan ahead and to get finance uh, if the banks will give it to you, of course. It's one of the reasons our banks are safe, is because they're also extremely conservative. We also have economic diversification in our economy, and this is an important factor. If you look at the percentages that the primary, secondary, and the services or tertiary uh, sectors have had in the economy over the last 50 years, you can see that the percentage that primary, the primary sector of the economy has had, that's not necessarily the actual amount of primary goods, but the percentage of the economy has decreased while the tertiary, the services, consulting, engineering, all of that sort of thing has increased quite dramatically uh, over the last 50 years. What that means is that our economy is spread across a number of sectors and a number of industries. So when we have an economic crisis like we've had in the last two years, we are much safer than a country like, say, Ireland. Unfortunately, business decisions often get made on confidence and Confidence in South Africa has been something of a roller coaster. I hope everyone can see that the line is a bit thin. But this is the Bureau for Economic Research's uh, Business Confidence Index, which has shown that over the last 40, 35, 40 years, we've been on a massive roller coaster in terms of confidence. And many of those, those downsides tend to be linked to uh, political uh, happenings. So in 1975, 76, we had the Soweto riots. 1980-81, gold went up to $800 an ounce. Uh, 1984 was uh, the Rubicon speech, which led to financial sanctions against South Africa. 1993-94 uh, was the lead up to the elections. 1995 was positive, because we won the Rugby World Cup. <coughs> Believe it or not, it really does have an impact. Uh, and then, through the, the, the mid-2000s, we've come down after 2008 and back up again. The Bureau for Economic Research's view is that this latest downturn is not necessarily a trend. When you go up, as you, if you look at the, the graph going backwards, you can see that it's not a smooth line. It goes up, down, up, down. But the general trend they feel is likely to be a lift in confidence. And when people are confident, they make investment decisions, they buy things, they spend ahead, and that's a positive thing for the economy in South Africa. Of course, a warning, this thing always has to come with a warning. Black swans are essentially things that happen that we can't control and that, are, that have a massive impact. 
and that what happened in North Africa and, and the Middle East over the last uh, eight months is regarded as a classic black swan. Huge impact, massive effect on a whole range of people and countries um, that nobody really knew was coming. But it had a big impact uh, and, it, and it knocked many of the, the, the happenings around the world off their perch. The ESCOM factor, ESCOM was a very similar example of a black swan. When, in 2008, when the lights went off, it had a very negative effect. So, but nobody really expected it, other than the ESCOM engineers, who knew it was coming for years and did nothing about it. But we, there are always the possibility of these black swans happening, and nobody really can tell when they're going to happen or if they're going to happen. I think just where we sit at the moment in terms of uh, South Africa's position in the world and our own position for ourselves, I think that 2010 was a new beginning for South Africa. And I think that there, there are two major reasons for it. The first was that we were able to show the world a different picture of South Africa. Now these are two images that have been stock images of South Africa, Crime and Robert Mugabe, and more recently we added uh, ESCOM and the lights going out and our dancing president and all his children um, to the way that the world sees South Africa. What has happened by hosting a very successful World Cup where there were no incidents, the people, the Germans that bought knife-proof vests um, didn't have to use them. Uh, that has had a very positive effect on the way that the rest of the world sees South Africa. So what it's enabled us to do is to join the world's cool places. And I've just got three examples of these places that have become cool through the use of big events like the World Cup. Barcelona in 1992. Today, Barcelona has 10 million tourists a year. It's one of the most visited tourist destinations in Europe. They have 3 million cruise line passengers going through Barcelona. Now this, in 1988, was a hole. It was a horrible place. Today, it's a vibrant, funky place that people want to go to. Sydney in 2000. Uh, old uh, Paul Hogan, we call that a knife, uh, walking through the streets of New York, uh, changed the view that people had of Sydney. And then, of course, Germany in 2006 with the World Cup, uh, they managed to shake off that, that image that they had for so long around Hitler and Nazism and show themselves as a friendly nation that's, that's able to welcome the world. <laughs> what South Africa's been able to do is to appear on the pages of National Geographic magazine with this picture of Soweto. Now that is a fundamentally different image to what you would have seen six months before the World Cup. So it has changed the image that people have of us, and that of course changes sentiment in terms of people's willingness to do business with South Africa and South African products. You know, there are a lot of things that I haven't covered. I've been, as I, as I said in the beginning, quite positive about the, the, the developments and quite positive about the possibilities that South Africa, Africa, and the world have. And I know that we've got challenges. If you want to find out about the challenges, just go and pick up the newspaper. It'll be wall to wall full of challenges. Because that's what we get fed on an ongoing basis. We have corruption, I know that, absolutely. We have issues of, of talks about land grabs, about taking land away without paying for it, about nationalizing mines and banks. We've got Julius Malema making an irritating noise on the side. We've got unemployment, we've got AIDS, we've got crime, we've got issues around education. We've got racism and reverse racism. These are things that affect us on a daily basis. But I think if we turn it around and we see those issues as the missing pieces of a puzzle, if you built a puzzle, you know you don't start by spending the whole night looking for a piece you can't find. You put in place the pieces that you can find. You then work with your partners as a team and you start filling in those missing pieces. And my last word on this is a second quote from Professor Philip Spies of Salamos University, that a positive future is not a spectator's future, it's a participant's future. And that is something that I'd really like everyone in this room to be looking at. Rather than just using the Constitution to fight the, fight the battles and lose the war, how do we, all of us, get involved in being a participant in creating the kind of future that we want to, to create and to experience rather than sitting back and watching somebody else create for us and end off second best because it wasn't the future that we were looking for. And with that, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.